Is, is my wife, is this mic on? Okay. Good morning. There you go. All right. Okay. Just want to be sure my mic was on here. We got some stragglers coming in. Kevin, get them people in here. Tell them to get up. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> we have a couple of things we want to share with you, and I know the weather is really playing fits with us right now as far as getting our people here this morning and getting them in and all, but um, needless to say, the good spirit is here, and so we hope that you will enjoy the service this morning uh, in spite of all the inclement weather, as we say. I do want to announce to all the priesthood that's here, and hopefully there's some that's not here that'll be aware of this and be here this afternoon at two o'clock. We have a priesthood meeting. We have some couple of issues that are pretty important, pretty pertinent that we need to discuss as a priesthood. So in spite of all the bad things that's happening in the weather, I hope that you can make it this afternoon at two o'clock. Uh, I saw Peggy. Did Peggy, is she still here? Peggy, do you want me to share about the next Sunday or you want to do it? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of prepared for it, but let me just uh, see on our second announcement there. And Peggy shared with some of you last week. Uh, next Sunday, Peggy will be our speaker for the hour. And she's going to be addressing uh, something that the women have taken on, and that is a project uh, that's designated to Outreach International called the Water of Life. And we're going to take up a special offering next Sunday. What we're going to do, if you give your, when you give your offerings in your envelope, those monies that you've designated for operating or tithing or whatever you've designated for will go to that. But any money that is not designated, and that would be loose money that we collect, and if you make out a, uh, that if you don't have, if you don't designate what's in your envelope, all that kind of money is going to go towards this project, Water of Life, for Outreach International. What this is is uh, those countries that are underprivileged and are struggling for the necessities of life. If we contribute as a congregation $48, it will go to building and dr drilling, I should say, a well that will provide water for 300 people. So for every $48 that we as a church and congregation raise, some have said that they would like to donate one well, and that would be wonderful. But we will collect the money uh, if you write a check out, go ahead and write it out to the church, Community of Christ. You want to put down where it says for or memo or whatever it says on your church, on your check, you can designate it for Outreach International. But the church is itself is supposed to be for, uh, made, go ahead and make it out to the Community of Christ Church. And this offering will be taken up, we'll only take up one offering, and it would be taken up at, during the 11 o'clock hour next Sunday. Also, on the 13th of May, if you haven't looked at your calendar, that is Mother's Day. And we're asking anyone that has a picture of their mama that they would like to have shown on the projector, if you will bring that picture in the next couple of weeks or so. Mother's Day is three weeks from today, I'm pretty sure. And if you'll just leave it in, the, give it to one of the deacons or someone here, but we want to be sure that David gets it. So if you want to just put it in an audiovisual room, that will be fine. But any pictures of any mamas that you want displayed during that service, provide us with that picture between now and that Sunday. You can't bring it that Sunday now. You got to bring it before. Don't wait until Mama's Day to bring that picture. It, it, it won't make, the, it won't make the, the, the chart. So be aware of that and just help us out in collecting some of these pictures here. You can email if you have that capability. Yeah, just email it to David as long as he gets it. That he's, the pictures that, that he collects, he's going to scan them, of course. If you want to email him one, that'll be fine too. 
Uh, again, we want to just call your attention to the uh, CFO report. And we did this last week. Uh, we just put that in there for your personal information as to how we're doing as a congregation financially. You see the figures there that uh, give us what we need to collect on a weekly basis to meet our budget. You see what we collected in March on an average each Sunday. And you see what our average is year to date. That would be the first quarter, January, February, and March. So that just gives you a quick synopsis of how we are financially. And so far, we're doing very, not very well, but we're doing well enough, let's say that. Uh, and I appreciate your efforts in uh, seeing that we meet our budget here. And I think that completes all that I wanted to share with you this morning. Again, to the priesthood, please try to make an effort to be here with us at 2 o'clock. Thank you so very much, and it's so good to see each one of you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll, uh, I'm balancing out the roster. I don't know. There we go. Y'all know I do a lot with Davidson High School, which is our primary school in this marketing area. Um, I'm the touchdown club director and alumni director there, and we are uh, getting everything together for our upcoming football season. The reason I got the uh, light here, you can kind of see it here. We're, uh, we're offering a Warrior Touchdown discount card. This is the first time we've done this, so we're trying to really make a, a, a good show right here. Uh, but they're $20. We're going to be selling them, the alumni, the football team, uh, the school basically for the next several weeks. But basically what they do is we've got local merchants uh, in the area here, and these are good merchants too. We've got Zaxby's, Outback Steakhouse, Bonefish, Chili's, Latin Dad. So, so there's, there's some really nice things, a lot of buy one, get one freeze and discounts here. Uh, they're $20. So if anybody would like to purchase one now over the next couple of weeks, just come see me. Uh, and like I said, we're always trying to promote our, our local athletes and student athletes around here. So any help that could be done will be certainly greatly appreciated. Thank you. I welcome you to our service this morning. I do want to make a couple of uh, announcements, whatever, about the bulletin. Uh, the front of the bulletin says, listen to the Good Shepherd as the theme for today. And indeed, that is the, uh, in the order of the World Church recommended themes. Now you look in your what's coming up announcements and it says next Sunday, the theme is listen to the Good Shepherd. How can that be? Well, uh, Helen and I did a swap of services in that, we also did a swap of themes. So that's why the theme on the first page of the order of service says bear fruit. That's actually listed in the World Church order as next week's theme. But we're going to swap out the theme. So never fear. It's uh, not, an, not an oversight. There is a method to the madness. And we will uh, look at... Uh, a number, some things about uh, bearing fruit this day. Uh, I want also to point out those that are serving with us today. Uh, doing the uh, reflections on Easter will be Addison. Providing a testimony will be Marina. Noah will handle the peace candle and prayer for peace. I've asked him to focus today in our prayer for peace on the needs of our prayer list. And uh, I asked him to pick out a name or two uh, just to focus on as a, uh, a request for peace in the lives of those uh, that are most close to us. Then uh, John will do the disciples' generous response uh, this morning. So I thank each one of those for helping in agreeing to participate. A couple of songs I'd like us to learn, and Anna's mentioned we probably already know one, but we'll, we'll just keep, uh, keep at it. 
are uh, hymns 150 and 159. Now, my intent here is that uh, these are short hymns. They're just one stanza each in the English anyway. And so uh, I want us, we may not necessarily sing them for quote unquote big church a lot, but I, I hope they'll get stuck in your head a little bit. And maybe it's something you can hum, something that will uh, kind of provide a little uplift for you from time to time. And uh, so let's learn those. We'll do, do them in the order listed, in 151st. Okay, it's got some, uh, it's got some pretty fast uh, parts to it, so let's see how we do with it. God is there today, as certain as the air that I am breathing, as certain as at dawn the sunlight brings the moon. As certain as I sing, I can know that God will hear my song. Let's do that again. Keep do it another time. God is here today. As certain as the air that I am breathing. As certain as at dawn the sunlight brings the morning as certain as I sing I know that God will hear my song thank you very much let's do 159 Thank you very much. I appreciate that. For our call to worship this morning, I take from Jacob, the third chapter, 125th through 129th verses. Wherefore, go to and call servants, that we may labor diligently with our mites in the vineyard, that we may prepare the way, that we may bring forth again fruit, which is good and most precious. Wherefore, let us go to and labor with our mites, graft in the branches, dig about the trees, both old and young, that all may be nourished. Dig about them and prune them and feed them. Prepare the way for them that they may grow. Hymn 87.
Our most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, in the name of the living Jesus, the risen Jesus, we approach thee this morning in the spirit of worshiping together. We come with our varied needs, and they're all important. But for just a moment, allow us to gently place them aside and pick them up if necessary after we leave. We truly invite thee to worship with us, to be our head leader in this worship, to feel your spirit so that we might grow, be better able, better prepared to reach those that we run into, and to ever be alert to the needs that are so conscious to us, sometimes we don't see them. Help us to be aware. Forgive us of our mistakes for this assembly here today. Open our minds that we might receive. And our goal, as always, is to do things every day on your, on your ways, the way you want us to do it, not us. To this end is our prayer together as we worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Uh, Addison is, is next, and I wanted to give a little introduction there. The, in the World Church Guidelines for today's service, it, uh, the Sunday is listed as the fourth Sunday in Easter. So we've had Easter recently, but uh, it's still a good time to reflect on some things about it. And uh, uh, Addison expressed some things uh, last week uh, that I heard her say, and I wanted her to share those with you also today. Addison. So last week at the Lunch and Learn, we were talking about how um, people are making decisions. And I said, Jesus made the decision to risk his life for us. I felt bad that he had to go through that kind of pain. But it is still a good feeling that he loved us that much and gave us his own life and had and to show us that we will see him again. As I have grown older, the presence of God has made many differences in my life. I have made many mistakes and done things that I regret. But the knowing that God is with me every step of the way has affected me. God's presence helps me make better choices and it helps me think twice before doing something I may regret. Dear God, help us to, in the world, to find peace. Help the police officers that have to go through all these people that do not like them, even though they are just trying to do their job. Help them to find the way and find the peace to keep doing what they're doing and protecting us. Help David Clark, who is going through a very hard time right now and just needs you to help him get through it. Amen.
I saw an experience on television a number of years ago. I would say I'd remember each bit of it, but as I mature, I tend to forget things. So possibly <laughs> you can, can uh, understand what I'm saying. Talking about the Good Shepherd. Going back to the days of Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese did their thing, in this movie, about two, three months later, there was a Japanese soldier, or a man in a plain suit, was talking to another friend, and the other man had come up, he had lost his wife during the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And as they were introduced, uh, the man that lost his companion said that this man here was the, the lead pilot he led the raid on Pearl Harbor, and he lost his wife, of course. The shepherd had a choice of forgiving and moving on, or he could have carried heartburn in his heart. I don't know what the man felt. I do not remember who he was. But this pilot this individual had accepted Jesus, he said so in the picture, and putting out his hand to the man who, whose wife he probably, when his plane flew over and the machine guns cut in, he might have been the one that killed her. But he had found the Lord. And he stuck out his hand, and at first he was a little hesitant, but he listened to the shepherd. And they shook hands. I wish you could see this movie one day. Maybe you will. To see the look on their faces as one shared the belief in the, in the Jesus and as one tried to share with the loss of a companion. Very difficult thing that he did. And as I think about Jesus on the cross and a song I'm still trying to find, I'll have to get Ann and Roger to help me because I know squat about music. There's a song entitled, part of the words is, As he hung on the cross, he had me on his mind. I've heard a lot of words over the years, but when I hear these, when I heard these, he was thinking about me as he hung on that cross. And as he hung between two thieves, the shepherd said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. I don't know if I could do that. I want to think that I could. I've never faced what he faced. But what a wonderful thought it is to know that that type of forgiveness is out there. That type of forgiveness must continue to be part of our lives. And I'm not standing up here saying to anyone that you're not doing it. All I'm doing today is reminding you and me of the ongoing importance that we be all aware of the shepherd that is there ready to extend relief to us. I have never heard an audible voice. I have never seen handwriting on the wall. If I did, I'm sure at our house, Linda would have a new exit out of my room. I've never, this has never happened to me, but my experience with the spirit is just so slight enough that here's what I want you to do, here's what I want you to say, and I've tried to do my best. I have fallen short many times. So in opening my time with you, I got David to help me. David, can you put that up for me now? You see, I started life at a very young age. Thank you, that's more, more than I expected. This is my birth certificate. And on the, on the back side, I was going to tell you that uh, I uh, was 19 and a half inches long, seven, seven inches high. I'd be stretching. You see, my mom redefined labor pains when she had me. Actually, I was seven pounds, 19 and a half inches. I found it the other night. I'd like for you to see it as you have time, although that does help. And that, that left foot never did fill in. I, I don't know why it never did fill in. This means a lot to me. 
because it's my birth certificate, but it shows that God entrusted to me when he placed me on this earth an expectation of response to him. My brother has told me of experiences when I was a kid, when I'd be playing too close to the road, something would say, pull me back, and the car would just miss me. Numerous occasions he shared with me when my life could have been taken. How the Lord looked after me then and how he still does, and each one of us. And no doubt each of you have testimonies of times that he has pulled you from the jaws of death, if you please. In 1956, my sister and I went to see Elvis Presley in the movie at the Sanger Theater downtown. The place was packed with teenagers. No doubt my sister was the oldest one there because all you saw was youth. And when he ran down the hill and he got shot and he, got, he died, all those girls were crying and carrying on. And so was she, although she was a little older. We got on the bus and we, and we started back home and we lived right across what is now the uh, uh, city garage downtown on uh, Virginia Street. And I started around the bus. I got off first. I started around the bus. It was late at night. And this black lady walking up the other side of the road saw that this person was passing in his car speeding. And a few more steps, if that car had hit me, I would not be here, of course. And she yelled out, stop, child. And I stopped and the car went by the bus, I could have been killed. I contend it was no accident. I don't know who the lady was, I hope one day I can meet her, but she saved my life. She was a part of that kingdom building effort. She is part of the reason that I am here. I love her and I don't know who she is, but I hope one day, I do hope one day, that I'm able to shake her hand and say thank you because I can still see the car going around the bus at high speed. And as little as I was, there wouldn't have been enough to pick up an assemble. But thank God, that lady was there. She recognized the situation. And she saved my life. And I am so grateful for her. Allow me, if you would, as I, we go through, I'm, uh, uh, Hale Wayne Gibson said that I could have an hour and a half since it's raining. I had a captive audience, but since it stopped, locked the back door. I won't be here that long, but I want to show you some things that mean a lot to me in reference to the Good Shepherd. How my Heavenly Father fed my life, protected my life, and has given me every opportunity to be the best shepherd I could be. I wish I could stand here and tell each of you that my response had been 100% correct. But if I did that, I'm sure they'd be writing on the wall and it would rumble like an earthquake, so I won't, I won't do that to you. But where kids benefit so greatly is in Bible school. My first experience was in the Zion Hill Baptist Church in Andalusia, Alabama, where I initially grew up. My aunt was a teacher and people that I haven't seen there passed away now gave their time to teach Sunday school. To teach Sunday school. And I told uh, Al, where are you? Hey, oh, excuse me. Quit moving around on me, will you please? His late mother, Sister Nungesser, and Sister Lavinghouse taught. Sunday school, they taught this time when we would gather together. If any people have ever been ordained, it was these three ladies and at Pritchard, uh, Allie Davis, for, for those of you here that remember her, she could, could deliver the Book of Mormon in class and you could see Emma Smith walking through the snow with a script stitched to the inside of her, of her dress. She could make you see the actual event and you felt what she felt. 
They had the ability to get this across. They didn't have the hands laid upon them, but I'm here to tell you from my own experience that these people that have, that have taught church, church school and you know, activities of teaching is important. I made the mistake once in class. I was a school teacher at a young age, and I made the mistake. I hadn't read the lesson. I said, let's read our lesson in class today. And this young lady got very upset. She didn't want to read the lesson. She wanted one prepared so that we could teach and share together. That never happened again. Sunday school is critical. For those of you that teach, and if you haven't, do so. And be grateful that you've taught others, or I would not be here. I wouldn't know anything about the good spirit. And now I have something that's very dear to my heart. Certificate of promotion from primary B to primary C, signed by your late mother. And I value that greatly. Now, our darling and sister Nungesser, they taught because they believed what they were teaching. They taught because they knew the importance of starting that shepherd while we were kids. And we went to junior church upstairs, and sometimes we'd go to big church. Didn't understand a whole lot, but that was something in those days to come down and go to big church. But going upstairs to junior church, all those tons of times that these people would sing songs, and they had old, I don't know what to call those, the songs on sticks, they would fold. They must have been about 300 years old, but they never broke. And she would put her hand under each thing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And they did it in a way that you could see the importance of letting one's light shine. They gave groundwork to all of us kids. And it helped to save lives. I've done this before, I'll do it one more time, and I'm very proud of this. My certificate of baptism. I was 10 when I was baptized. Oh, it was referred to old Brother Jernigan. We say old, O-L-E, I guess. Uh, he, old, old bro Brother Jernigan, was a man of God. And I remember him coming over to the house and sitting down in the living room and wanting to finalize that I would be baptized, I don't think Dad was fully in for that, but Mom wasn't but about five feet, and she was like E.F. Putton when she spoke, you listened. She said, this one's going to be baptized. And I was at age 10. So about three months later, Granny was staying with us, and I rode my bike home, and I went in the house, and I said, Granny, I've got to be good. You know, I've been baptized. I didn't understand then what little I understand today. But I knew that it was the right thing to do. The foundation of life, the foundation of building that shepherd life, they gave each of us. They gave it to Al and Al, all the other kids. Uh, Miller, uh, Melvin Miller was there. Melvin and I was baptized that night along with Paul Jernigan. Think about what would have happened if they had failed to do that. They had a game to go, go to, didn't care. They didn't care about ordination. But I contend to this day that if anybody has ever been ordained do, to do things in this church, these people and others had that endorsement. Forget about the laying on of hands. The fact is they responded to the needs of all of us kids. And a lot of us, not all, are still in this church today. Baptized by Brother H.H. H. Jernigan, confirmed by Brother Gomer Miller and Brother John Darling. I don't know how many have got that. I thought I had lost it, and Linda can tell you that I began to panic, because this is very, very dear to me. Not much writing on the, on the page. But it tells about the shepherd, the good shepherd, reaching for me. It tells about my response at a young age when understanding of that wasn't what it is today. But you could feel in your body, you knew it was the right thing to do because these teachers delivered in such a loving way that Jesus couldn't have taught any better. I owe them a great deal. His life lingered on, and I've continued to, pardon the expression, mature. 
Reaching an age, which a lot of kids do at uh, 12 or 13, thinking they're grown. My mom and I had our, I still call it patriarchal blessing. I'm sorry, I know they say evangelist blessing. Call the prophet and tell him, I don't care. Says right here, patriarchal blessing. I've read this a number of times. I hope all of you will take the time, if you haven't, to read that again. And, and today in the church, uh, you can have, if you please, a second blessing at the age you're at to get guidance through the patriarchs of the church, I'm calling them. Do it. I'm going to share just a, just a little bit of this, of this blessing. The first paragraph, placing my hand, this is Brother, uh, Brother Yeager, J.H. Yeager, we called him Old Brother Yeager. He taught at, I uh, taught, he preached a sermon at Calioka one year. He was, I mean, at Frederick Branch, he wasn't supposed to come by. Our speaker couldn't be there. And uh, I asked him, he said, well, I'll take it. Now, he was on the way home. He was tired. He was an older gentleman. But he preached from Sunday morning to the following Sunday night. He read a few scriptures and he never used a note. He was a minister down in the islands and he dealt with everything from watching and peeling people's heads that had sores on it. Just one testimony after the other. And when that Sunday night was over, we were begging for more. And we interrupted his going home. Thank God Brother Yeager had time to do this. Went to Ruth Burleson's uh, house where she lives now. Ruthie's not doing well with dementia, but will always be kind of like a second mom. Let me share just a few of these key words. I won't read the whole three pages. But if you haven't read your blessing, or if you don't have one, get one. God expects us to do all we can on our part to get guidance. I wish I could stand here today and tell each one of you that I responded 100% to what the Lord said. And I would be stretching things a tad. Let me share just a few things with you that are important to me as all these three pages are. Placing my hands upon your head, I present you to our Heavenly Father, praying that they may come to you through this ordinance in this church the blessing that you now seek as a means of spiritual strength, guidance throughout, and I underline that twice, throughout your life. He mentions that my name, Joseph, has a particular biblical, what am I looking for there, connection. Now my middle name, don't laugh too hard now, me and my brother have had fun with this lately, is Gwen. G-W-I-N-N. Through school, I caught a lot of laughter. Girl's name, right? I heard that repeatedly until the seventh grade when the teacher called and said, Joseph, uh, here? From then on, it was Joe Brace. Up until then, it was Gwen. And I got more laughter than any comedian. Because some of the boys and some of the girls insisted on kind of making fun of that. that be that, as, be that as it may. It says here that even I had even talents and characteristics that, that should be used for the benefit of the kingdom building effort, for the benefit of being a shepherd, not only to me, but to those that I come in contact with. I had that assurance right here. You made your choice early in life to follow Jesus taught by your mother and taught by church school teachers. My first church experience, I was sitting out in my sister's, our first car, by the way, a 1960 Biscayne with no radio. It did have a heater. It didn't have a radio, and we were lucky to have, have, have that apart. I'm sitting in there reading from the Book of Mormon. I think it was published by the Mormon Church. How we got that, I don't know. I'm sitting there with my feet up on the steering wheel, open up and reading, and I felt the Spirit that was so unique that I went inside and I shared with my sister and my mom. And my sister said, isn't that marvelous? His first experience, and it was. I felt the spirit, not a beating of the drums, no voice, but I felt enough that told me at that time that this is a me. 
This is mine. Your example that influences their lives will in time produce fruits of righteousness in their lives and credit. And, and the credit for such conditions will be given to you. You will receive, therefore, commending, commending of God in a way of, a way of at eternal judgment. I can remember times in high school because of what I was taught for by all of my contributors walking up South Street and having some of the teenagers of that day shouting, uh, well, it wasn't respectful, Hail Mary, full of grace. I knew what they were saying. I was not angered. I was not offended. I just kept walking. To so go back and to argue would have been fruitless. I just kept carrying myself right on up there. I did not respond. I think Jesus, he didn't respond either, and I'm not <laughs> comparing myself to him. But I remember that experience quite well. And I can remember other times in my, in my life when we were go into a baseball game, and all the kids would go across the road and walk up about 100 yards to supposedly get a soda. And I was going to go with him, and, and Don says, you can't go. I said, I'm a part of this team. At that time, I tried my best. May I say, to be a Christian, young Christian child. Get... And I looked at all those guys. I said, let me, let me tell you fellas something right now. If you think that Coach Wilcox does not know what you're going after to do, I said, you're crazy. I said, he was young one time. He's not stupid. But out of all the kids there, they told me I couldn't go. As I think back on that, I said, thank you, Lord. Maybe something was done or said in some way that caused them to say, you don't fit in here, which I didn't. And I walked on back and waited until they come back. Coach Wilcox knew they went up there to smoke a cigarette or Someone buy a can of beer and drink it. He, he grew up one time. He was an older coach. I never said a word. I didn't have to. So I thank God that my, may I say, accuser somewhat, recognized a little bit or enough in me at that point saying, you don't belong to go with us. They recognized it. I thank God for it with hopes it may pay a dividend somewhere down the road. I don't know. I hope that it does. You're now in the very difficult years of your life when you yourself are required to shape your own life. I had reached a point, like a lot of kids at that age, thinking they were grown. And mom made a comment one time when I had disobeyed her. She said, this is going to hurt me more than it hurt you. I made the mistake of saying to her, if it's going to hurt you like that, I wouldn't whip me. And the times that she did whip me, she didn't by any means draw blood. And then she said, now you hug my neck and you tell me you're sorry. How I respect her. I have wished many times that I could just see her one more time. She called my name the last time in 1980 because she had a lot of little pin strokes. But her, her more than dad, taught me to do the right thing. She set the table for me. She wasn't going to sit there and, and take notes. She taught me forgiveness. She taught me repentance. She taught me the importance of saying, yes, Lord, I made a mistake. And she taught me about what accountability means. It can be forgiven. But she said, son, there's accountability that goes with one's mistakes, even if you're forgiven. She said, you may have to be accountable for that. Well, she got my attention. She was a good mom. All moms are good, by the way. All moms are good. In my blessing, God encouraged me to associate myself with I'm going to say quality people. I don't remember the young girl that was dating, but it was, it was a teenage, they called it a teenage nightclub. 
And at that time, I believe it was right around the end of uh, airport, and you could hear them juking, they were getting down. They were just getting down. And I, I remember telling the young lady, I knew I shouldn't be there. The spirit told me I shouldn't be there. And I told the young lady, she said, I said, I'm not going in there. I turned and walked back to the car, figuring maybe she would follow me, and fortunately she did. And it was the same young lady that later on, I took her home late, got home a little later than I wanted to, about midnight, and I pulled up in her driveway, and she made a comment, would you like to come in? The good spirit, folks, I am telling you, didn't drop a load on me, but it entered into what I call my spiritual intellect, knowing that if I went inside, it would be a downfall. I did not go. And I quit dating her. Thank God for his blessings. And then it mentions in my blessing about the selection of a companion. And thank God she sits right back here now. And I contend she's got a place already in heaven secured. Because anybody that can put up with a Bracewell almost 48 years deserves 10 or 12 or 15 medals. And God, her patience, I marvel at. I know at times, at least a couple of times, I have perplexed her just a little bit. She takes care of me like a mother does a child. Thank God for Linda. The Lord blessed me with the opportunity of being a deacon. I enjoyed it. I looked at it as an opportunity to see to the temporal things of the church, to see that the saints were comfortable. I took bulletins around back to make sure that everyone had one. I enjoyed being God's deacon. I have heard deacons say, I'm just a lowly deacon. I told that to Charles Lombard one time, going to Pritchard Branch, and he had the ugliest gray mercury of anyone in the world. I don't, it had no paint on it. It had four wheels, and we didn't have one. That made it a Cadillac. And I made that comment. He wheeled off on the side of the road, and that road was so bumpy then, and he stopped, turned off the engine, and he jumped up in my face with his finger. He said, don't you ever tell me that you're just a deacon. You're God, deacon. Reached over it, cranked up, and never said another word. He had me to understand that this calling was used to glorify God, not me. And don't you downplay it for one minute. He was furious. Charlie Lombard, oh, a lot too. He was furious. And then in 1979, I was called. At that time, it was a call to elder, but uh, Brother Richard Barber said, oh, he told Dan, he said, it's wisdom that he serve as a priest first. He was right. I enjoyed serving as a priest. And on November the 1st of 1987, for some reason, he asked me to serve him as an elder. I would not call me to the priesthood. I know me. I, would, I guess I could have used an excuse like Moses did, but God told him, I'll use your brother Aaron to be your mouthpiece. And Talmud said, you want to think about it? I said, think about what? All these years that I've been telling you about, what, about, what was there to think about if the call was there and it was real? Wait on what? I told him on the spot. I said, I'll accept it and do the best I can. Dick Barber taught the elders class. Now let me tell you something. When you take one of his classes, you go through the mill. He doesn't miss an eye. He doesn't miss a T. He had us turn in a full wedding as if I had to do the whole thing, a funeral, and I, maybe there might have been one other thing. And he wanted it after he got through with the third class. I was the only one that turned it in. But I gave it to him. And I let Linda type it for me. He was after showing us proper procedure. When to lay on hands, when not to bless his heart. I want to share something now too that is very dear to me. 
There was a time when the game of golf was more important than the ministry of the Lord Jesus. I wasn't a bad player, I wasn't a great player. I played eight to 10 to 12 rounds a month. And on most Sunday mornings, around 8, 30, 9, 30, 10, when they were breaking open the service, I'm, I'm teeing off on number one. I had a grand time. I didn't drink anything. I had a grand time. Because the Lord's work wasn't important to me. I more or less had taken my doctrine covenants and threw it in my bookcase. It wasn't important. Well, the Lord put up with this for a while until late elder Dan Stacy one Sunday morning. He had to walk to buy his uh, Sunday paper. In those days, there were a quarter, a long time ago. And as he got ready to buy the paper, he said the Lord spoke to him, called Joe. Well, Dan, being in the counter, looked at his hand, and he said, 25 cents, if I do that, I can't buy my paper. Well, he called me with the diamond nickel. As he walked back by the, the place that had taken his money so many times, he kind of looked around and shook it, and the door opened. Dan got his paper, walked on. He said they owed me one paper because it took money in the past. He went home, and on his manual typewriter, he wrote something that the Lord told him to tell me, because you see, I thought I was tough with the Lord. Worldly things are more important. March, uh, March the 7th of 1977 at 840, the Lord spoke to Dan. It's labeled to Joseph. It's entitled Joseph. Now listen close to this. It could be you he's talking to, but he was talking to me. I, the Lord God, love you as no human kind can love. I know the frustrations you feel and would relieve you of those burdens if you would come to me and lay them at my feet. He was still pulling for me. The evil one desires to instill within you this hopelessness with malice against me because of that which he and his followers had done in the midst of my majesty. He seeks you for his own. Is there anyone here that can say that they've never had to deal with this battle? If you haven't, you're stronger than me. I never prepare, try and prepare a sermon that I don't feel is ever going one way and one going the other. I told the Lord the other day, I said, I need to know if you want me to do this. You put me in the position. Now, I need to know if you're going to support me. And almost instantly, I felt just enough of the spirit and what I call my spiritual intellect that said, I'm with you. And that helped. My love, Joseph, is an abiding love. You have coveted with me before my people and have accepted the mantle of holy priesthood. And remember, Joseph, your most sincere testimony before my priesthood at that place called Blue Lake. Before my high priest, did you testify of your desire to serve and your mother who sacrificed for you? Every mom sacrifices for her son. She may not like what he does. But you can't beat a mother's love. I feel for Mary. I want to talk to her one day. I want to find out what she felt as she watched her son being murdered. I want to hear her say what she felt the best I could. I really long for that. Then the Lord says, come to me, Joseph, and trust me. Trust in me. Lay aside your fears of chastisement. And trust to see, trust me to heal the brokenhearted. You have a work to do that I have called you to do. And boy, then he hit me below the belt, I call it, with words I'll never forget. Remember, it is not my work that shall be destroyed, but the, but the ones who stand in my servant's way. That shall be sifted. I love my cre creation, yet shall they as you reap what they have sown. Be careful and return to the love that is eternal and to those who will share your sorrows and your joys, those of the household of faith, thus saith the Spirit. This is one that Dan Stacy gave me. 
back on May the 7th of 77 that reminded me of what I was, what I'd been baptized into. It was up to me to get up and go or face the inevitable. That's the shepherd that sold after me. In respectfully in closing, I want to share this with you. I love this little story. I hope that it, you've heard it before. Bear with me. There was an actor, a great orator that could quote anything and make people marvel. He quoted the 23rd Psalm, and people just stood and clapped and praised. What a wonderful job. Sitting over in the corner was an old gray-haired preacher. His eyes could not see. But the Bible that he held was ragged, and it was one that he had read many times, and all that meant memorized most likely every verse. He was called on to recite the Lord's Prayer. He did. The room got quiet. The actor walked out into the room, put his arm around the old man and said, I know the 23rd Psalm. This man knows the shepherd. I love this story. It's so, it's so, you've heard it. I know you have. I love it. I am thankful for God that continues for some reason to hold on to me. I'm grateful that I'm here with you. Possibly you don't know how many of you Make me feel better when I see you. You see me mingle. It's to shake your hand and to help you feel better. A lady that used to be back in the back, I forgot her name 20-something years ago. I'd go around, place was packed, I'd shake her hand, and she said, you make me feel like I'm important. I said, you aren't important. From just a simple handshake, she was ministered to. So as I'm mingling and shaking hands, I want to see you. If your face smile, I want you to know I'm there and that I'm going to do the best I can to help you where you and I can. If I can, I'll find some help. With that said, we've got time to get home and watch whatever. If it continues to rain, I'm going to need a TV dinner. We will. I do thank you for your time. And I hope that we have been ministered to together because we are all shepherds. May God bless us to this end. <clears throat> How many of you have been to uh, Ruby Falls Cave in Chattanooga? And that, uh, well, when you're down there, they get it all lit up, and then for a moment, they turn off all the lights, and it's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of you. And even though I knew they were going to turn the light on, I had a little panic in me. I remember as a teenager of going tobogganing in Michigan, during the winter time with the snow. And uh, it was a full moon evening, and the moonlight was so bright off of the snow, it was like daylight. I realized, as I was thinking about that experience, that what Jesus Christ wants from us is that he's the light of the world and he wants us to be a moon. He wants us to reflect what he showed us. And so I can be his hands, I can be his feet, I can be his voice. And how many people see that reflection in your daily lives? Uh, yesterday, Angie and Ken and I were in the car leaving the house, and a uh, neighbor lives up in the subdivision. The only acquaintance I have with him is that uh, I know his name's Jim. I know a little bit about his wife. And he walked up, and the first thing he said 
to Angie and Ken was, I love John. All I've ever talked with him is in my front yard. And yet he said that. Several days prior to that, he had found out about Louise passing. And he came over to the house to talk to me. And the first thing he did was kiss me on the forehead. I have a tendency to believe that I was a reflection of Jesus. I was being a moon to Jim, but I also realized he was being a moon to me. And so as we come, may our offering today be a reflection of what Jesus means to us as we share his light in the world. In that offering, you can also offer yourself to be a reflection. Will those taking up the offering come at this time? Dear God, we come before you at this time mindful of our challenge to share our time, talents, and treasures. May we, in our giving, not only of these monies, but of ourselves, reflect Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
How good it has been to be with brothers and sisters and to hear the telling of the times of people's lives, of the activity that the Lord has wrought in the daily lives, the moment-to-moment lives of various ones, to recall the great promises that every prophet who has ever prophesied has always conveyed the promise of the Lord that if we go to and thrust with our sickle, we will reap. Let us, O Lord, not be afraid to do the things that you are calling us from moment to moment, to do the small things, to do something that would reach out. For we know the promises are great and that you are sure Thanks for loving us, Lord. Take us from this place to be your servants. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. question. I cannot find the answer. I would if I knew it. 